I want to welcome everybody. I know we have um, from our students uh, all the way to, uh, I know we have at least one person from, from Arkansas. This was published uh, nationally by the FAA. I know we have uh, several attorneys, including most, uh, all of us on the panel are all, all lawyers um, and involved in aviation. Um, when we put this together, and each year usually Kent does at this time have a major event surrounding drone, drone law. And we started in 2017. I know Daryl, you were with me when Judge Mullins came by and we had to get him down from Cleveland. And here we are in 2020. What more could we have on today with the Boeing 737 MAX coming back into service? Uh, we're at the height of a pandemic and we're in drone week. And I asked uh, Tim Ravitch, a good friend of mine from the Florida Bar. I'll introduce him here in a second. Uh, I know Alyssa from, from Kent, Alyssa Robinson and Liz Porter have been absolutely instrumental in helping us put really our first webinar uh, together for the college. And I wanna especially send out a thanks to them and thanks to our Dean, uh, Christina uh, Blobaum for, for supporting us in this. But to our keynote speaker today, uh, Tim Ravitch, you know, I might as well just, we can read his bio, but um, years ago when I, uh, received and was sworn in as a member of the Florida Bar, one of the first things I did was sign up to be part of the Aviation Law Committee. And he was the chairperson. And I remember meeting Charlie and Tim at those meetings. Um, and one of the very first meetings, I met Tim and he handed us his manuscript to Introduction to Aviation Law. And certainly one of my inspirations why I'm Kent State teaching aviation law, because he gave us that idea and that important goal that we need to teach aviation law to the next generation of aviators. And I certainly, uh, certainly was influential in my career coming to Kent. And last year, he had his book actually published. And we're going to be using this in some of our course work coming up. So great textbook in aviation law. And congratulations, Tim. I know you've been working hard. And I still have your manuscript. So, but Tim is, is an attorney from, from Florida. Uh, he's an assistant professor um, and internationally recognized authority on aviation law. He's assistant professor at University of Central uh, Florida where he um, teaches in the Department of Legal Studies. And I asked him to come on and again, thank you, Tim, for being here with us. And he is definitely one of the authorities on drone law. And I think apropos to what we're going through, he's going to talk about drones and COVID and privacy and all those wonderful issues that I think are really important. So Tim, thank you again for being here with us um, and thank you again for spending time with us. So Tim, thank you. Good evening, everyone from where you are. You can hear me okay? We'll, we'll, we'll consider that a uh, yes. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Jason uh, Lorenzen, uh, uh, Elisa Robinson, Liz Porter, uh, the Dean, and everyone at the College of Aeronautics and Engineering uh, there at, at Kent State. This has been a really uh, fun process. Everyone's made it extremely easy. Um, and I'm flattered by Jason's uh, remarks. Uh, Professor Lorenzen, I'm here at your invitation. So uh, you've, you've certainly done well. Uh, for yourself, but I think your remarks go to the importance of building relationships at any stage of your uh, career. People like to stay in touch, uh, particularly in aviation. Uh, so having said that, thank you. Congratulations on what looks to be a, a very good a panel presentation following uh, my comments, and I'll do my part to uh, contribute uh, here. We're here, of course, um, because it is Drone Safety Awareness Week. Uh, fortunately, it's not Drone Safety Week, because that hopefully is every week but it's Drone Safety Awareness uh, Week here. And we are, I, I, I was interested by this uh, slide. They seem to, uh, the FAA have designated a different uh, program for each day. And I guess today's Thursday and it's about start a program, learn about starting a public safety program. My comments are, uh, were prepared independent of that, but it actually fits in quite well because I do want to talk about uh, what's, what we're all dealing with, which is of course this, um, this devil of a thing, uh, this, coronavirus. And in talking about it, uh, let me just give you my flight plan, uh, which is first I want to talk about what's in the air. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is uh, coronavirus, but it is also relatedly drones. Uh, we'll then talk about the um, Internet of Things and the information age and what that has to do 
uh, with the controversy and potentiality that drones offer in the COVID pandemic. And then the third part uh, will be what I'll call back to the future. Uh, we'll talk about old property law uh, back uh, in the very early part of the last century, talk about privacy law, and then back to the constitution, back to the uh, future, I call it. And then we'll go on final approach and I'll give some uh, concluding uh, remarks as I can. I welcome questions uh, at any time during the lecture, though as a um, organization, as a panel, we've agreed uh, that I'll manage those questions at the end, but, but chime in and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them uh, at that time. So um, healthcare providers around the world, if you don't know, are desperate for a technological fix to mitigate uh, the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And my proposition here is that drones may be uh, such a solution. I say maybe because I want to be uh, more neutral in this presentation. I want to give you the, the good, bad, uh, and the ugly. Uh, people have different viewpoints depending on obviously what their financial interest is, what their politics is. Uh, they might say, hey, I really value privacy. I don't want drones flying under any circumstances. And there are others who uh, think, uh, and there are good arguments in this way, that drones really can be a better device, a, de a device for uh, good but they are enormously controversial as I hope to present to you here. As you can see from this slide, there are a number of drone applications in the coronavirus. We'll go through uh, some of the more interesting, compelling and controversial uh, ones. Look, it's real simple. Uh, drones can be used by uh, law enforcement authorities around the world to enforce social distancing, identify people with fever detecting thermal imaging, or assistant contract tracing. These are all now uh, regular words uh, in our vocabulary, uh, unfortunately. They can also uh, be used for facial recognition. And because of these enormous capabilities, uh, from a lawyer's perspective, that means that we're potentially running against, if not afoul, of bedrock constitutional and common law principles, such as free speech, the right to associate, privacy, and federalism. And so we'll investigate uh, some of that. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, by way of example, has asserted that the use of drones represents an unacceptable criminal justice approach to, um, to policing by robot. We'll evaluate whether that's true or not. Now, here's an article uh, back in May, which seems like 100 years ago, but it's from the New York Times, and it says, boy, this is the moment that drones were built for. And it's an interesting article I commend to you because it goes on to say that not only are drones doing wonderful things, but we may be entering a new era, thanks, yes, I said thanks to COVID-19, that makes drones a regular part of how we manage public affairs uh, and government. And again, my objective here is to be more specific in a moment, but let's continue on with the, the overview uh, here as we describe all of the things that drones can do in COVID-19 times. Here's a, just a simple title why medical drones are taking off in healthcare. There's some very interesting uh, cases that students no doubt are studying about air ambulances. Uh, right now, helicopters are uh, transporting people from hospitals. There's a lot that can be done through aviation and the agility and nimble nature of drones in particular uh, is a compelling one uh, for I think self-evident reasons, especially for the audience of uh, someone who would be interested in attending a, attending a webinar like this. I mean, what are drones, right? They're unmanned. So the human costs uh, go down. Uh, drones are less noisy, uh, less expensive than helicopters. And those also are compelling dimensions of drones uh, that allow us to integrate drones as really a medical device, uh, more than a, even an aviation a device. So there's no question uh, this is uh, something that can be used. Whether it should be used is something that uh, I'll have more to say on at the conclusion of my uh, remarks. Now, uh, there are plenty of articles here. Here's one from really just a few days ago, a November 1st Wall Street Journal article uh, that talks about uh, how a handful of drone delivery startups want to transport COVID-19 vaccines from distribution facilities to healthcare centers. And they're all vying for logistical roles in what is likely to be a sprawling and complex um, undertaking. The picture you see here uh, is of one of these companies that has done business with Merck and Walmart uh, that could help position them to take part in high profile effort to distribute the vaccine, which uh, by all indications, thank goodness, is maybe a month or two or three away, depending on how you look at it. 
So here, pharmaceutical giant Merck actually partnered with Volsani in September to fly medicines and vaccines from Merck manufacturing facility in North Carolina to a nearby a health clinic. And these vaccines, um, at least one of them, I think it's Pfizer's in, in particular, has to be kept at a very cold negative 80 degrees Celsius. So getting this uh, vaccine from point A to point B in a quick way um, that might be uh, faster, for instance, than last mile transportation is important. And there's no surprise that a lot of money, venture capital is going into these sorts of uh, companies. This is true overseas as well. Australian drone company Swoop Air is also preparing for a COVID-19 vaccine breakthrough. Some of uh, this company's aircraft can fly up to 90 miles on a single charge and carry more than 500 doses of vaccines. So again, we're, we're balancing in our conversation here, uh, healthcare uh, against aviation technology. And the aviation technology is important here. It's autonomy and electric propulsion. And bringing those things together uh, could be sort of a, a perfect storm in a, in a good way here. Just last month, the startup of Swoop Aero had discussions with public health officials in the Democratic Republic of the Congo about delivering a, a COVID-19 vaccine via drone. And they also anticipate doing the same in Australia and New Zealand. In, in my view, it seems I see a lot uh, of this particular company. It's a San Francisco-based uh, startup founded in 2014, which is like 100 years ago in aviation parlance. But Zipline uh, airdrops medical supplies and ferries tests for more than 1,000 hospitals in Ghana and Rwanda by drone. And for a while, I had seen a, a report that there were more COVID-19 tests being done in Africa than anywhere on the planet because of drones, right? Able to go from uh, one part of town uh, to the other. To date, Zipline's fixed wing uh, drone, as you see here, has already made more than an excess of 30,000 deliveries of medical products in those countries since the start of the pandemic. So we're, we're in a way here at the beginning of my conversation, talking a lot about the past, aren't we? We're supposed to be talking about the present and the future, but this has been done. And some of the concerns are getting closer as it comes to denser population centers. And of course, in the United States specifically, but it's here. Uh, interestingly, some of the novel drone operations, in fact, are getting the stamp of approval by regulators and lawmakers. By regulators, I mean the Federal Aviation Administration. And by lawmakers, I mean state uh, legislatures, even uh, Congress is getting involved in allowing regulations to um, fuel rather than impede this technology. And in my view, that's a good thing. When I was looking at uh, this particular uh, slide, uh, we're talking here in April, 2019, where Wing, which is the drone delivery service owned by Google's parent company, Alphabet, they got the first FAA commercial package delivery uh, certificate to go uh, from Christianburg, Virginia, a town of about 22,000 people, uh, to a town near uh, Blacksburg, uh, Virginia. And I thought a quote by one of the wing spokesperson uh, was very interesting to me. What the person said is, quote, it's one of the few emerging technologies that has attracted a lot of early adopters over the age of 65. In other words, this isn't your sort of dad's video game. Uh, this is something that uh, people in an older generation uh, are uh, really uh, adapting to and uh, seeking out. There's, a, there's an obvious, obvious appetite for it. Now, there's another uh, company most recently in 2020 here uh, called Drona, and they have began a partnership with Walmart and Quest Diagnostics. Quest Diagnostics, you might have been to, the, they'll draw your blood and test it. Drone Ups aircraft are delivering uh, COVID-19 test kits to single family homes in North Las Vegas and Buffalo, uh, or a suburb of Buffalo, within a one mile radius of designated uh, stores there. And there's something that uh, might interest the engineers among this audience, which is some of these startup companies, um, they know they're doing a good thing, they're delivering medicines, potentially delivering vaccines, but they're not primarily interested in that, believe it or not. What they're interested in about is testing their machines, testing their aircraft. And COVID has given them an opportunity to test things in autonomy, in electric propulsion, and even in beyond visual uh, line of sight, which is of course the holy grail of drone, the ability to fly your machine beyond where the remote aircraft um, pilot can see. So this is a, an opportunity uh, at the risk of minimizing the seriousness of COVID there is an opportunity here for companies now to be able to test their machine uh, 
just by way of delivering a medicine, which is a good purpose and, and will encourage, I think, social acceptance. So that's my overview. That's sort of part one. Uh, that's what's in the air, COVID and drones. They really are flying. And that's cool and all, but really what we're talking about is less aviation for at least a, a moment and more internet of things, more information revolution. Drones you see, and I'm sure many in this audience know, can be equipped with very sophisticated software and hardware suites, right? Uh, some can be equipped with what's called stingrays or cell site simulators to collect information from people's mobile phones, night vision cameras, GPS sensors, radar, LIDAR. There's a number of avionics and equipment that drones uh, can be um, equipped with that concern privacy advocates, concern regular citizens, et cetera. It doesn't help, of course, that even the word drone itself has military connotations. Uh, whether you're Republican or Democrat, which is, I guess, a dangerous thing to say at, at the moment, wherever you stand, whoever the president of the United States is, will be, or was, drones are a very enticing asset for a commander in chief for the same reasons they are in the commercial dimension in respect of keeping costs down, minimizing costs uh, to human beings. But because we still use the military word drone, some people have sort of a jaundiced eye uh, towards it. So much so that one town in Colorado even proposed a tongue-in-cheek ordinance back in 2014, allowing people or allowing citizens to shoot down drones invading their airspace. That's not the law. Please don't do it if you're in Colorado or anywhere else. It's not the law, but it was uh, an issue that lawmakers uh, felt strongly enough about based on what their constituents' wants were. So I guess my point here is that when we're talking about drones, you're not going to hear me, and I don't think you're going to talk hear any from many engineers about how sophisticated uh, these machines are as airplanes. They fly, they're interesting from a lot of different aerodynamic perspectives, but really what's interesting here is what they can do in terms of data. Uh, I happen to be general counsel of a precision agriculture company, and this was a slide we often used. Yes, there's our airplane, but the really interesting stuff is on the right side of your screen, right? Where we see data, where we see crop health, where we see uh, things that a, a farmer would have to walk the entire field to see. Now we can do it in a data-driven way that's more cost-effective uh, as well. But again, as I say, with data, there are concerns when you're not looking to see if there's, um, you know, how your beats are doing, but when you want to see how people are doing, well, that gets people's backs up. And uh, DJI, which of course commands approximately 80% at one point of the uh, civil drone market, uh, has gotten a lot of pushback uh, from this, uh, and they're doing a very good job, actually, I think, to try and uh, communicate uh, with people what they are about. Having said that, here's a New York Times article that uh, they quote uh, the, um, the user agreement, and it says, please note that if you, you conduct your flight in certain countries, your flight data might be monitored and provided to the government authorities according to local regulatory laws. I'm sorry to read to you there, but the, the text here is important. To the extent this was the DJI user agreement, right? You buy your uh, uh, DJI uh, Phantom, uh, there's mine, right? Well, I sign up to this user agreement. I, it's sort of a contract of adhesion, I suppose. Understand uh, this verbiage here. Uh, to the government authorities according to local regulatory laws, uh, that may not necessarily mean Cleveland or Columbus or Cincinnati. It might mean the central government of China. That's the controversy uh, right now, which is does any of your information uh, go to people or governments that you don't want it to do? And DJI has spoken forcefully uh, on this, but I want to communicate this here just to frame the issue and show you where people are uh, expressing uh, concerns. All right, now the fun part of my lecture, uh, Jason told me that um, Kent State would be giving away a drone as part of this conference. So here's your chance, which one do you want? Okay, I'm kidding, although it'd be cool, maybe next uh, seminar. Um, I show this slide, this is a, a DJI Mavic on one side, uh, on the left, and a Skydio X2D on the other side. So which do you want? Um, there are a lot of compelling reasons, one or the other, I'm not gonna get into it, but I will uh, address uh, an issue that is controversial right now, which is country of origin bans. In late 2019, the Department of Justice recommended its agencies be wary of foreign manufactured drones. The Department of Interior, meanwhile, grounded 800 strong fleet, uh, which includes models DJI had customized for the agency, saying it was concerned Chinese drones or drone companies were a security risk. 
And the policies are widely seen as just targeting DJI, sometimes unfairly. So new regulations are in play and proposed legislation to restrict government agencies from buying foreign drones. And I'll let the audience decide where they fall on that. There's a, a lot of commentary on whether this is something we want to do. Uh, just looking around my office, go ahead and look around uh, uh, wherever you are. There's so much uh, that's foreign made in our uh, global commerce uh, chain. Should we single out uh, drones or not? I don't think it's an easy question, by the way, but the slide is meant to communicate to you that privacy, which is really what we're gonna start to talk about here in just a moment, uh, is really playing out uh, in the unmanned aerial uh, vehicle uh, space. Here, for example, is what the Defense Innovation Unit uh, is coming up with. If you haven't heard of them, they are a Department of Defense organization founded to help the US military make faster use of emerging commercial technologies. That's a good thing. We want our uh, military to be on top of things. And in fact, the Department of Defense and the Pentagon were concerned about uh, the American marketplace's ability to compete with foreign manufactured drones, right? There were just good products being made overseas. What can we do here in the United States to, um, to, met, to meet that, especially with respect, not just to drones, but other technologies. In any event, the Defense Innovation Unit has actually uh, provided a list of only five drones that have been approved to use at federal agencies. So this is interesting. Um, it's unclear to me, uh, just to give you some commentary, whether or not this is a Republican or Democrat issue. I can make arguments one way or the other, but I think you can see sort of on a bipartisan uh, level, particularly in today's environment, uh, members of both sides who are focused on national security who find the argument that, nat that foreign made uh, products could infect our national security, that's something we should be uh, aware about. Let's transition a little bit to the civil side, right? Where the Federal Aviation uh, Administration really is the, um, the vested uh, authority to, uh, to, to uh, with jurisdiction over drones. And in August of 2016 and effective in June, they come out with part 107, which at this point is, um, sort of old news. I mean, people understand 107. There was a, a, a non-linear process to get there, uh, but it's there. It was a well-received uh, rule and people can fly their drones. Now, for civil and commercial purposes, pursuant to a performance-based type of standard scheme. Now, some of the controversy or um, blowback to part 107, obviously, is that it doesn't allow uh, just a, a green light, a blank uh, certificate, if you will, uh, for beyond visual line of sight or some of the um, operational parameters uh, that people really uh, want at this point. But it certainly was, to use the vernacular of the day, a good start. Uh, and I would certainly agree with that. The FAA, however, in providing its rules said that, you know, we're not really gonna be engaged in the privacy debate, whether drones are a good thing or a bad thing for, drone, for, uh, for society. And I think they said so not because they um, won't engage in privacy issues, uh, but ostensibly because the FAA said it can't. It doesn't have jurisdiction or really the competence to do this. So in the Federal Register where they published their rules for the first time, they said, quote, adjudicating private property rights are beyond the scope of this rule. However, the provisions of this rule are not the only set of laws that may apply to the operations of small UAS. With regard to property rights, trespassing, for example, well, those issues may be addressed by state and local trespassing laws. And indeed, that is accurate, right? The FAA doesn't need to make trespass laws or voyeurism laws or uh, hunting or fishing uh, laws. States do that. Your cities do that. Your municipalities do that. The FAA helpfully, however, provided a fact sheet, uh, which is loved and hated, uh, to be honest with you, by uh, different sides of the equation. But the FAA said plainly, look, there are some things like police powers, including land use, zoning, privacy, trespass, law enforcement, that are generally not subject to federal regulation. Now, though the FAA uh, said that, they did suggest that uh, people check in with them uh, and sort of uh, work collaboratively with the FAA. For their part, the FAA really is interested in other things, but they do want consultation if there's still concerns about privacy. But I think you can appreciate the difficult situation that the FAA is in. The FAA manages the airspace, whether it's a toaster flying in the sky or an unmanned aerial vehicle or a pig, uh, just being sort of silly here. Uh, they're concerned with how things fly safely in the navigable airspace. Beyond that, 
they're not being asked uh, as a matter of uh, law to regulate some of these other issues. It does touch these issues, privacy, and so they can't get away from it completely. Now, in the vacuum, as it were, that is being created by no federal, no single uniform uh, federal law or power governing the issue of privacy, especially in respect of drones, there's, here you go, a patchwork of laws. Every state has different laws, including no laws with respect to drones, and that can uh, complicate things. Here in Ohio, all right, the location of Kent State, I wanted to uh, signify that Ohio does not have any drone laws. If you looked in the books, there's one law, I suppose we could maybe make an argument that it impacts drones. This is uh, an aviation law that simply says that you cannot fly uh, within the lands or waters uh, administered by the, I think it's the forestry division without permission. And you see the highlighted uh, language here that um, includes unmanned aerial vehicles. So the, the law was amended to include the latest uh, technology. But here's an example of a, a very populous, dense state with multiple uh, centers of uh, commerce, including rural areas. And truly there are no uh, laws other than part 107 for operational purposes, I should say. Here in my own state of uh, Florida is the Freedom from One Unwarranted Surveillance Act, which has the sort of unfortunate acronym of FUSA. But in any case, the FUSA here says that law enforcement cannot use uh, a drone for searches and seizures. More on that in a moment. I also wanna show you uh, here this provision B, which says that a person, a state agency, a political subdivision, meaning the government, may not use a drone equipped with imaging uh, over privately owned property. Okay, cool. So they can't fly over my house. I mean, if there's a fence around my house, I'm clearly indicating that I don't want anyone coming into my property without my knowledge. It should go that you can't fly over my house either. More on that in a moment too. The reason I highlight this though is to show you that with respect to COVID, what if you are at a restaurant and there's a drone flying overhead? Can it take your temperature using some of the sophisticated equipment uh, it has? That's the issue that we're really uh, dealing with. And I've written about it in an article uh, that if you want to look at, I, I commend it to you, of course I do, right? Privacy law and the drone age lowering reasonable expectations. And that's what I wanna to talk to you going into the third segment of my, of my talk right now, which is talking about privacy law. What is privacy? How do we get there? What does the law look like? How does it apply to drones? and then talk about what our expectations should be as citizens relative to that right. So first of all, maybe we start with reasonable expectations. Uh, people in Ohio seem reasonable to me, right, uh, Jason? But, but here's an opinion in order from 2015, not that long ago, United States District Court uh, opinion. I never like reading during a presentation, but this one deserves it. Uh, here is uh, District Judge Graham synthesizing what the case is about. The plaintiff's complaint alleges a vast government conspiracy involving alien mind control technologies, unmanned aerial vehicles, circling her residence and bombarding it with radiation and nanosensors deployed underneath her skin for non-consensual human experimentation and torture. Um, the deposition would have been interesting. Regrettably, we will never have an opportunity to get to the merits because this case was dismissed on standing. In any event, it's interesting for me as sort of a, a, an academic at a level to see how drones are entering into the litigation landscape in reported uh, decisions. And more practically, uh, and we're really getting to the, the meat of the matter, with respect to COVID, uh, maybe Mrs. Miles is uh, sort of um, not putting together the best uh, litigation strategy, but other um, people around the country do have uh, what may pass the laugh test in terms of uh, what drones are doing. Uh, so here, for example, in Westport, uh, Connecticut, was an idea to use a dragonfly, that's the Canadian-based uh, drone you see here on the left, to monitor social distancing and detect fevers and coughing as a tool in the fight against the coronavirus. So I ask as you uh, kindly listen to my presentation to think about your own sensibility. Do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing? And I think there are arguments on both sides of the equation. Uh, here's uh, the person, I guess this is Celsius, it must be 36.6 degrees. Uh, is it so wrong to have detected this person's temperature to see that this person really should go back home for, uh, I presume this is a male, uh, his own benefit uh, and also for society's benefit? Or should we say, hey, this is off limits? 
Well, remember what I showed you with the uh, Freedom from Unwarranted Surveillance Act, at least here in Florida, although I should say that law is similar in Tennessee and other states that have adopted similarly worded statutes. It applies to private property. Hey, this guy's on a public sidewalk. Why shouldn't we uh, record him? And that's the argument of, of many, which is you're on a public uh, uh, highway or a road in this case, you have no expectation of privacy and certainly would not be reasonable. So here's one example of drones detecting in arguably a very invasive way, but in a public uh, place. How does the law uh, balance those things? Here is a spraying drone. Uh, this is a drone at a stadium spraying, uh, uh, well, certainly in agriculture, you could see where this has, uh, I don't know, sort of uh, beneficial applications. No one's going to get too upset uh, with that. But what if we're spraying uh, your home or um, a building or inside an auditorium? Is that more controversial? Well, some people are saying, don't worry about the controversy. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Uh, here's, for example, a, an article from uh, May of this year saying fever detecting drones don't work. Some of those issues aren't just uh, sort of alarmist. There is uh, evidence and empirical data here showing that uh, camera stabilization, winds, outdoor temperature can impact uh, whether or not you're taking an accurate temperature. So the lawyer in me almost sees this as like, uh, you know, an evidence issue and a, an appeal issue, right? What happens if they take your temperature and it's wrong because it's very cool out or the drone moved on you? What appeal rights do you have if the government then says, sorry, you can't go to a supermarket today, you've got to leave because you've been identified as, um, as somebody we don't want outside. That's a serious issue. That's a civil liberties issues uh, issue. And it's one that you don't really have recourse. And that's a concern for anyone who values the constitution. Here is an article in uh, the Lancet Journal of Infectious Diseases. How interesting is this, that uh, drones and aviation are finding their way into medical periodicals and well-respected ones at that. Uh, the Lancet uh, simply said, look, you know, these sort of interesting applications for drones and COVID don't work. Uh, they're saying uh, the inconsistencies in camera output over time and across the sensor will affect camera applications based on relative temperature differences, as well as user-generated radiometric collaboration. Now, I don't know everything uh, about that, but I know enough to parse the language here. And I think you can see how this sort of language will give uh, ammunition uh, to people who are just uh, anti-drone or pro-privacy, to say it more uh, positively. On the other hand, people who really are for the application would say, hey, I got it. We, there's room for improvement to perfect this technology. The question is, do we just shut off improvements at this point and say, look, under any circumstance, we don't want drones doing this? Or do we take another side as a society and say, well, uh, there are problems. It's not perfect. It's wrong to say it won't work under any circumstance. Let's give it a shot. Uh, that's a fork in the road for, for lawmakers, which is to say a fork in the road for the constituents who tell their lawmakers how to vote. Here's a third application uh, drones have been used for, broadcasting uh, drones. In other words, drones that are overhead. This is a, uh, a tweet I guess I got from somebody uh, from CBS News. And it's hard to see the drone if you look at the person's head and you just sort of go up from there, you, you see it. Uh, so this was a drone in New York City uh, that broadcast what you're reading here. This is the anti-COVID-19 volunteer drone task force. Please maintain a social distance. That's good advice. But who on earth is the anti-COVID-19 volunteer drone task force? I don't know, and many New Yorkers had no idea. Is this New York? Is this the federal government? Uh, who is the authority here? And uh, that, that was off-putting, as you can imagine, uh, to many uh, people. So maybe it's just better communications necessary. Maybe you're not anti-broadcasting, but uh, just let us know you're going to send your drone. But this is an interesting uh, example of drones uh, being used by somebody really know what their authority was uh, to be telling us to keep social distancing. Finally, there is the law enforcement uh, angle uh, here. And like broadcasting drones, um, some skeptics claim that that application uh, really depends on sort of cultural, historical, and political uh, factors. Some countries uh, have no problem, you know, no problem. My privacy is less important uh, than uh, the health, safety, and welfare of my community. Uh, others see the two as uh, a, a sort of a false choice. China, for example, does uh, come to mind as a country that uh, obviously is a communist regime, really can uh, restrict things in a way that the United States not only can't do, 
uh, but doesn't want to do uh, and shouldn't do uh, because of uh, our values. Uh, in any event, here's an example of drones being uh, widely used in uh, China. And the article here just says China is using its high-tech surveillance uh, tools. Well, duh. Uh, the question is, uh, how widespread should that be? Should we adopt some of the lessons? So uh, the government's one thing, um, whether you're um, Neighbor can fly over your, your home uh, through a drone is, is another sorts of, uh, sort of uh, question. And it harkens uh, back to, I think one of the, the first cases in US law about unmanned aviation and its relationship to people on the ground. Uh, this is a simple uh, case. Uh, it's a case from the 1800s. Uh, guy flew in a balloon. Uh, the balloon crashed on uh, someone else's garden. And a number of people from the community came to see what, uh, what happened and in doing so trampled on the homeowner's garden. And the aviator was sued, right? I mean, he, he hurt the person's garden, the homeowner's garden. And he said, well, look, I mean, I couldn't control the balloon. It crashed where it, it crashed. And the court really had to decide, well, you know, how do you balance the property interest, the rights of this um, homeowner against uh, the right to fly, uh, to coin a term. And the court said, look, tough. You were in this airplane, uh, so to speak, a balloon, and wherever it took you, you are responsible for that entire flight. And what this case, Gal versus Swan, really uh, showed was an early view of aviation under the law, that aviation was an ultra-hazardous activity. If you assumed the risk, as it were, I'm, I'm lightly using that term, if you assumed the risk, you were responsible for the whole chain of events, uh, even if you, uh, your defense is, I didn't really cause this or I didn't intend it, too bad. And that loosened over time, of course, uh, more, uh, most impressively in the U.S. versus Cosby case, which no one knew about uh, this case except for us who really studied the area long before drones. It's now uh, quite well known among anyone who has even a passing interest in drones. We call it the chicken case. It's in the 1940s. Uh, that's not unimportant. What was going on in the 40s? You had big war planes, right? And a farmer in North Carolina uh, complained that military jets were coming so close over his house as they landed on uh, the glide slope that his chickens were freaking out and basically killing themselves by bouncing into the walls out of fright. True story. He also said or alleged that his uh, family had such nervousness, uh, I guess, I guess early, early stage PTSD before that phrase was even popular. He said there was sleep deprivation, nervousness. We can't, he said, have these planes continue to fly at such a low trajectory over my house, which by the way, was very close to an airport. And by the way, when I say close, there were airplanes just about 67 feet above the tallest tree, uh, according to uh, the allegations. But what's interesting is the court said, well, we feel for you. We understand uh, your claim here, which is a Fifth Amendment claim for uh, basically a taking, that in flying its airplane so close to your home, the government has allegedly effectively taken your chicken business from you. The chickens are dead, you can't sell chickens. And the reason you can't sell chickens is because the government is flying its planes at such a low altitude to land. Well, the court said, and by the way, when I say the court, I mean the US Supreme Court said, sorry, we live in a different age today. We live in um, a, an age where the airplane is a part of the modern environment of life, the court says. The inconveniences, the court says, which it causes are normally not compensable under the Fifth Amendment. In other words, it just can't be a trespass every time an airplane flies over your home in the new aviation uh, era. And that court uh, or that case has given us uh, something to ground us as we think about drones. In other words, well, can a drone then fly at 300 feet above your home? The answer generally is thought of as no, uh, that the navigable airspace exists above four or 500 feet, thanks to Cosby. But Cosby doesn't really say what the low uh, altitudes are. It simply uh, gives us some structure that, look, you're able to fly over someone's home. It's probably not going to be uh, compensable unless you can show uh, that it was sort of in the what they call the immediate reaches of uh, the part of your land. So as many uh, aviation students know, uh, we, of course, have airspace classifications, uh, class A and B and C and so forth. Uh, some are towered. Some are uncontrolled airspace, and we really have rules of, uh, rules of the road and roads, so to speak, in the sky. Drones complicate that traditional understanding. They challenge Cosby because we no longer really understand 
where it's acceptable to fly and where it's not. In other words, the hypothetical I often like to give to students is, okay, so I can't fly at 500 feet uh, or 400 feet above your home, but can I fly in a subway station? That's airspace. It's actually below ground, but can I fly in the airspace there? Interesting sort of hypothetical uh, to think about. Drones can fly where no other types of uh, aircraft uh, really uh, could. Now, we've talked about privacy. We've talked about property in a way, and let's try to bring those things together now relative to what law enforcement can do leading up and keeping in mind what we're talking about here, which is how drones can be used for COVID. Small drones offer journalists and police and law enforcement an asset whose agility is superior to that of traditional airplanes. It maximizes information gathering and surveillance capabilities and minimizes the human cast, all things that we've talked about. There's this funny thing, it's called the Fourth Amendment, uh, however, in the Constitution, which of course says, and, and law students uh, should know this well, even undergraduate uh, students, that the government, the government cannot conduct an unreasonable search and seizure without getting a probable cause uh, warrant. And notice that searches and seizures are allowed, but it can't be unreasonable. And the question then becomes in the context of drones, what is reasonable, what is not reasonable? Do you remember the Miles case I showed you, the, the Ohio Federal Court where she thought, you know, there were laser beams coming in under her skin? I'm not sure that's, uh, that strikes us as, as serious. And the court never got to the merits, uh, jokes aside. But when does it become serious? When are you concerned that the government, by getting your temperature, uh, by reading your body heat, is conducting a search that is unreasonable? Anyone know what this is? Uh, one of the famous law professors says he teaches what's called the Katz versus um, United States case. It's a case that basically uh, says that the Fourth Amendment uh, protects people, uh, not places. And what Katz uh, said is that if you're in a phone booth, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy if the government were to tap the wire and intrude in your conversation. Katz is still, it's a 1967 case, it's still sort of the case that's the cornerstone of a lot of privacy law, especially privacy law uh, defined in terms of reasonable expectation. It used to be the case you see in a case called Olmstead versus United States in 1928, that if there was no trespass, there was no search. In other words, if I don't come onto your home or onto your property or into your um, uh, car, there can be no search because I haven't uh, intruded into your property, right? As technology has improved, however, and Katz does this, we have shifted away as a country from a property-based understanding of privacy to one that is based on expectation, which is sort of, I guess, what's in your head, right? Although it has to be reasonable by, I suppose, a more objective standard. So as we've moved away from that, it brings into question, what about drones? Using a drone, I can be on my own property and I can use my camera to look inside your house or see what you're doing by the swimming pool, not to personalize it, right? I haven't trespassed in any sense of of uh, the meaning of, of that word, does CATS apply? Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Well, Riley uh, versus Florida was a very famous uh, case. Pasco County uh, Sheriff's Office uh, here in Florida got word that uh, someone was um, uh, growing marijuana. They flew a helicopter over the greenhouse. They saw uh, that he was growing marijuana. He sued. He tried to suppress the evidence and the Supreme Court of the United States said, sorry, the helicopter had a right to be at that altitude and whatever they saw is whatever they uh, saw. And so they were able to uh, get away with that. All right, let's fast forward as we round out the presentation here. I think we have a, a few minutes uh, uh, left on this. So here's a recent case uh, from uh, 2020, actually. Actually, this was uh, decided just a few days ago. And it's an interesting case. Um, you see the quote on the right, even a pandemic cannot slow the pace of killings. Uh, regrettably, Baltimore uh, has been dealing with uh, quite a lot of homicides and shootings. Uh, I think some of the most in the nation, uh, they would say. And so uh, the Baltimore Police Department came up with what they called an Aerial Investigative Research Program, AIR. And what it does is it took aerial observations of public movements. And what it did is it took dots of people and said, look, we're not going to see uh, who you are, what your eye color is, uh, uh, what your identity is. Uh, and the court and I actually said this uh, was okay, that this type of um, aerial surveillance was fine. And, and may I read to you, it says, our opinion should not be overread. Although we conclude that air does not invade a reasonable expectation of privacy, 
our decision should not be interpreted as endorsing all forms of aerial surveillance. So maybe this is, maybe the best we can do, ladies and gentlemen, is case by case. Some drones can spray, some drones can take your, uh, your uh, temperature. Maybe they can take your thermometer, your, your temperature by uh, an aerial thermometer in Nebraska, but not in New York or vice versa, et cetera. There's another case I should tell you about, Kylo versus United States, a Supreme Court case where the police used a thermal imaging device to see if there were hot spots on uh, this house. Because where there were hot spots, yep, there were green lights. Uh, and those green lights were growing marijuana, et cetera, et cetera, if you follow my meaning. The um, court, uh, by the, uh, in an opinion written by the late Justice uh, Scalia, uh, said, well, uh, no, this uh, violates uh, the Fourth uh, Amendment, actually, because uh, the thermal scanner that the police used was not in general public use. In other words, they had some, the police had a very fancy uh, device that no one else could have, and we don't like that for Fourth Amendment uh, purposes. So even though the police were across the street, uh, no, no trespass, no search, right? It's not Olmstead. And even though it's not cats, because you really didn't see any uh, people and it's about places, uh, they said they would not allow this. And you are seeing, and I think you'll see it, uh, including with a, a, cons a more conservative court now, a restriction on Fourth Amendment allowances. But let me ask you about that standard, the, this idea of uh, in the general uh, use. How about a drone? Is a drone in general use? I don't know. Here's a picture I took in New York some years ago. Drones are being sold everywhere on city streets, et cetera. Here is, I, I did this last night. I thought this would be fun. Can I get a thermal imager? Sure I can. I can get, there are about 135 options I have just on, on Walmart. Not too, uh, not too poorly priced, so it could make a good Christmas gift. In any event, look, what we're talking about is uh, the challenge of regulation. Uh, some of the issues uh, that I think we're exploring uh, here in this uh, presentation remind me of uh, bicycle cases back at the early part of the century where people wanted to ride their bicycles on the highways, but the government said, sorry, you have a right to ride your bike, but we've got other important modes of transportation. We just can't allow it. We're not depriving you of your life, liberty, or property, but there are times where we, uh, uh, the government, have to assert some social welfare uh, program that's ahead of personal uh, interests. Be that as it may, uh, right now, there are exceedingly few states that actually regulate the government use of drone. So I suppose that's why you're seeing places like Connecticut where law enforcement are saying, hey, it seems like we have a blank check to use a drone for thermal imaging, facial recognition, and so forth. And I should tell you that it's interesting, even under HIPAA, for example, HIPAA applies to private companies. So to the extent that law enforcement were to use a uh, thermal detecting uh, drone to get personal uh, information from you, like your, your temperature or, or something else, they're allowed to do that. It doesn't violate uh, some of the privacy laws uh, here. So in a way, ultimately, I think what we come down to is that this actually is a lot about people more than it is about the device. Uh, back when cars uh, were first designed, judges couldn't even afford cars. It's true. They would say so in, in court decisions. And this was a, a case, I'm showing a slide from uh, Lewis versus Amaris, a uh, Georgia appellate decision in 1907, where the court was actually asked to decide whether a car was to be classed with bad dogs, vicious bulls, evil disposed mules, and the like. In other words, was a car uh, inherently dangerous? And I think what I would conclude with is saying that I'm not so sure drones are inherently dangerous. It's right, the purposes that people uh, use them for. Is it a bad thing that we're afraid of or is it bad people uh, we're afraid of? And again, this is going to be uh, something that um, is just going to depend on your sensibility. I, I, I hope we'll have time uh, now or offline uh, to, uh, to get some thoughts on that. Just as 9-11 was a watershed event for aviation security, so too will this pandemic have lasting legal and practical implications not merely in the area of aviation law, but in the broader area of aviation technology for the foreseeable uh, future. And so look, there are good applications. Uh, in Korea, they're doing a great job with Seoul Korea. These are drones. Uh, they are doing announcements. This is a, a wash your hand, uh, uh, sort of a drone image. So the government there has organized an unusual way to both thank its frontline medical staff for their hard work and remind citizens to abide by uh, preventative uh, measures. And now the piece de resistance for um, this presentation, we'll see if this works. This is my way of saying, have a good Thanksgiving and thank you for your kind attention. 
Can we agree not to do that? It's four minutes of that. Um, this was roasting the holiday turkey. The FAA found uh, this fellow on uh, YouTube, as I did. Uh, let's agree not to do that. Uh, but let's also agree, um, well, first to move forward, uh, let's agree um, that really what we uh, should aspire to is a balanced approach to this. Uh, drones are not evil. Uh, taking people's temperatures in public places does have a beneficial use if it works. Um, avoiding extremes is going to be important here. With that said, I think we've uh, come in with a, with a few minutes uh, to go. I know we started with a, a, a few minutes uh, behind, but I, I do want to thank you for your kind attention. I truly wish uh, this was possible in person. It's always nice to see people read reactions, uh, but, uh, but I thank you. And I, I certainly thank uh, Kent State University and the College of Aeronautics and Engineering uh, for doing this. Uh, Professor Lorenzen, thank you so much. I'll, I'll stay around, obviously, for the um, uh, uh, second half of the presentation. I'm very interested uh, in that. Uh, so thank you. Be well. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, we'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass it off to you. Hey, thank you so much, Tim, for your um, for your presentation. I know there's a few questions uh, that came up, and I can read a couple of these for you, and we can see how many how many of these we get uh, through. Um, here we go. Uh, what regulates the use of drones for gathering of criminal evidence, and what needs to be done? for the use of that evidence in court? That's a pretty interesting uh, question coming from one of our students here. So it's about what, what laws exist to allow law enforcement to collect evidence? Mm -hmm. Yes. There are a number of laws. I gave you the example of Florida is the Freedom from Unwarranted Surveillance Act. Tennessee has uh, almost an exactly, uh, exactly worded statute that's also known as Freedom from Unwarranted Surveillance Act. And those laws generally say that law enforcement cannot use a drone for any evidence gathering purposes, except, and then there are usually like five exceptions. Uh, one is if there is an imminent, say, national emergency. Uh, I often think of the, ba the Boston Marathon uh, bombing. Uh, imagine if we knew something was going to happen, we could fly a drone out there uh, and, and survey uh, something. That, that'd be uh, important. Um, there are other uh, examples, you know, a, an imminent security threat, uh, reasonable belief that something is going to happen. So there are a number of exceptions that these statutes explicitly provide. Um, I don't know how much they help law enforcement uh, because if they, it, it, it puts a lot of uh, judgment calls uh, to law enforcement, but they do have the right to take some evidence. Let me finally say that if law enforcement do take in evidence, um, against in violation of this statute, uh, it is considered inadmissible in court. So the case probably would be uh, would be hard to pursue. Okay, thanks. A um, couple of interesting question here from a participant. Um, so does in certain countries mean that flying in the United States might mean that my data is shared with China? So I can't comment definitively on that, but I will say there is an awful lot of uh, concern uh, by serious people uh, that that may be uh, the case. Now, I encourage you to uh, go to sources here, right, as, as we all should, as, as good lawyers, as, as people interested. In other words, uh, DGI has been uh, uh, on this issue, obviously it concerns them deeply. Uh, I would encourage you to go to their website, uh, read uh, what they're saying about it. Uh, their position is this is a safe product? And the answer is no. Um, look, there's always people who are just going to disbelieve things to disbelieve things. I, I, I'm not one of them. Um, you know, we want to make sure uh, that that's the case. If someone says uh, that uh, that information is not getting there, you want, want assurances that way. It reminds me of sort of Alexa. Well, Alexa only works when I say, hey, Alexa. Well, no, it's listening all the time. Again, I'm not drawing any comparisons to, to DJI or, or other companies. Uh, but it's, it's attention. I'm just um, trying to pick some of the questions here before we move over to the panel. Some of these questions, which are great, we'll um, come back and bring it up with the panel. Um, there's an interesting uh, question here, a little bit long, but uh, from a student. The UAS capabilities and potential applications are vast to say the least. Safety certainly comes to mind in an era where aircraft density within the national airspace continues to increase. With an increase in aircraft numbers comes an increase in potential collisions 
an increase uh, in opportunities of technology exploitation from adversaries to inflict damage among other issues. My question has to deal with the security concerns of potential adversaries to hack or overtake control of an aircraft such, a, such as a UAS. The future of hijacking opportunities where the hijacker is remote and possibly concealed. How do you see ways to mitigate through regulations such as a threat from taking place in a highly populated area to an adversary, which is a target rich environment? So um, the, the questioner is right. Uh, I guess I'm happy to report that lawmakers are uh, to say to, at a minimum aware of uh, the issue, because what happens if you get one of those spraying drones, uh, for example, and it's one thing if it's just spraying chemicals in an empty auditorium, but what if we fly it over, whatever, you, you, you can think through the, the doomsday scenarios. Uh, this is a real concern. I, I do not have an answer to you, I, what I, a specific answer. What I can tell you is the range of ways in which we would uh, find a solution. One way, uh, and this is typical of just legal thinking, one way is to just flatly ban it. Uh, we're not having drones that are, are going to uh, fly over populated centers, period. And there are a number of laws throughout the country, state laws, that say you cannot fly, for example, over critical infrastructure. Now, if someone does that, obviously they're in a host of trouble and it might be easy for them uh, to, that, to do that. Drones are a lot smaller than you know, an F-15 even. Um, the other way to say it is to, to try and strike some balance, to uh, require anyone who's going to operate a drone or manufacture a drone to certify um, certify information with respect to the cybersecurity protocols that is, that's on their drone and to really demonstrate to regulators, to citizens, why this should be accepted from a legal uh, and social way. This is a very, very serious uh, concern. Um, I think I'm still sharing my screen. If you look at this video, this is a, a forecast of an unmanned uh, urban air vehicle. Uh, the idea is that we might be where the Jetsons are, if anyone even knows that cartoon anymore. In 2025, you might have air taxis. Uh, think of a company called Uber. Uh, they're all about something called Uber Elevate. They want to be able to take you from your college to the airport uh, in a, a flying uh, taxi. Uh, the concerns also are there. May I also say that um, the question is, is so good, it's so present tense, and yet what's discouraging is it's also sort of ancient history. I think there was a 60 Minutes uh, program some years ago that showed how easy it was to hack uh, even a car, a smart car. So these are very serious uh, concerns that aren't just military. So it's a great question. And hopefully uh, students are thinking about this as they become the next generation of uh, lawmakers and judges. Thanks. I know it's a little bit after eight. And I'm just wondering if we could now switch over uh, to the entire panel, Tim is going to be staying with us and we can get some of these other questions answered. And I'm going to hand this over because we've got a really good panel of um, attorneys, uh, seasoned aviation professionals. I'm going to turn this over to my good friend, Daryl Clay. Just as an introduction, he is a uh, pilot. He's a commercial pilot. He's actually an attorney with Walter Haverfield. Um, a good friend of mine, I've known for several years, flown with him several times. Um, has a, a very nice uh, single engine, um, uh, each Cicada, uh, great little plane um, to fly around in. And he's also um, served in many different capacities up from uh, the president of the Cleveland Bar Association, Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, as well as now he's um, your president elect, correct, of the Lawyers Pilots Bar Association? That's right, Jason. Thank you. I'll be uh, president of the, serving as the um, President-elect of the LPBA, and in uh, hard to believe, 2022, uh, that's just around the corner, I'll be the president of the LPBA. So thank you, Daryl, for agreeing to be the moderator. He's going to guide us through the next hour, which we're going to have a pretty good, hopefully a lively discussion here I've brought together, and I'll let you, Daryl, introduce everybody. Thank you. Well, thanks. And, and just as an additional point of reference, I come at this per perspective from, like Jason, not only having a, uh, a license to fly manned aircraft, but also having my Part 107 license. So with us tonight are three distinguished uh, aviation professionals. Uh, Colonel Joseph Zeiss, who is the Senior Advisor for Aerospace and Defense for the Office of the Governor of the State of Ohio. Uh, Bob Tanner, who's the Executive Director of the Ohio Federal Research Network. And of course, Jason, um, 
who I think of as uh, an exemplary Renaissance man with a background in aviation, immigration law, and to top things all off, a professional organ player. So uh, Colonel Zeiss, let me turn to you first. Um, what is your role as being senior advisor for aerospace and defense for the officer of the governor of Ohio? And um, uh, what does the governor think about uh, drones uh, and uh, maybe their use in connection with all the things that we're dealing with right now with COVID-19? Sure. Well, um, thanks very much, Daryl. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be here, and certainly the governor sends his uh, his greetings. Um, aerospace defense in general, uh, very very important uh, to Ohio, to the economic development of Ohio, to Ohio operations. Um, so I do uh, really four things for uh, for the governor, um, and, and operate in, in four pillars, if you will, of the aerospace and defense world. We can kind of talk. Uh, about how those apply each individually to uh, uh, to UAVs, to drones, uh, as the case may be. Um, first and foremost is preserve, protect, defend, and expand Ohio's uh, federal and military installations. And it's, it's fundamental in terms of uh, Ohio's aerospace and defense economic posture and uh, and the strength of our uh, of our communities. Um, the second, and, and as I said, that, that's really the foundational piece. Uh, the second piece is to work to increase the synergies and the uh, research portfolios of Ohio's national level laboratories. That includes the Air Force Research Laboratory, NASA Glenn, both Lewis site, Plumbrook site in Sandusky, as well as Ohio's own national laboratory, Battelle, and then the underlying university research institutes that are, that are, that are immense, huge, uh, in Ohio the, and the universities, I mean, clearly where Kent, Kent State is, is incredible capability in, uh, in aviation, in UAVs, in aerospace, just a, a prime example. Um, and then the third is to work with Jobs Ohio to attract mission, industry, and jobs to Ohio in aerospace and defense. And the fourth is to support STEM as well as university educated and career tech center trained workforce to, uh, to fill uh, one, two, and three pillars. So, so to cycle back, um, what's really important, I think, um, in terms of Ohio and the integration of UAVs, drones, the installations, that's, that's fundamental to uh, the Ohio Air National Guard out of Springfield, the 178th wing flies, of course, uh, Reaper aircraft, MQ-9s. Uh, they have the command and control element. They don't have a launch and recovery element. In other words, the aircraft don't take off and land out of Springfield, but they actually fly out of, uh, out of control systems at uh, Springfield Air National Guard Base. Um, and also clearly it's integral to uh, the research development as well as acquisition that occurs at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in both the Life Cycle Management Center and uh, the Air Force Research Laboratory. And there's a large educational element on unmanned systems, on flight control systems. It's actually where I got my master's degree in aeronautical engineering at the Air Force Institute of Technology. So really there across the broad spectrum. If you move then to the second pillar, you'll notice I talk to these as distinct pillars, but there's a lot of gray zone in between each one. And I think you know, you'll, you'll see that. But in terms of research and development, the Air Force Research Lab is, uh, is significantly vested in research and development of both the air vehicles uh, that are that are the uh, the unmanned aerial systems themselves, the components of the systems, but also the sensors. I want to distinguish actually between in our discussion the air vehicle itself, right, the carrier, uh, and then the sensors, which may be visual in in the visual spectrum. They may be in the infrared, ultraviolet spectrum. They may be radar sensors. Just depends. But um, but there is uh, there's clearly the sensor technology and then made it to the uh, to the uh, to the air vehicle itself. So so variety of different uh, different research topics uh, going on at the Air Force Research Lab, as well as NASA uh, NASA Glenn specifically NASA Glenn and urban air mobility. They are they are uh, heavily engaged in urban air mobility, working tightly with uh, the Air Force Research Lab as well. Um, you, um, you, you heard Tim talk about the defense, um, uh, 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 the, the whole of the defense innovation unit. 
the Air Force's version of that is AFWorks. They work very, very closely. They are part of the Air Force Research Laboratory working Agility Prime. That's the urban air mobility that is developed commercially and then applied to government needs. And, and that's, uh, that, that's researched heavily at the Air Force Research Laboratory itself. And the underlying uh, research institutes support all of these because everyone is engaged, uh, you know, clearly in this uh, in this industry. It's it's fascinating both in terms of the vehicle, the sensors, the law. Uh, several of the law schools are actually engaged in development of UAV law, how it applies. And you heard, I mean, Tim's you know conversation on privacy, property, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment. In, uh, in, in, you know, in, in a, as applied to UAVs, in, incredible. It's incredibly important in many ways. It's, uh, they are issues of first impression. And so fascinating, fascinating stuff. Attracting an industry, so now pillar three, attracting an industry in Ohio is very important, very important to the government, um, is certainly uh, UAVs, urban air mobility vehicles, the technology that surrounds those are key industries to attract. And, you know, I think Bob can talk a lot to the attraction elements of, uh, of the UAV, of the drone community, of manufacturers, because truly you, this is a great place for prime integration of UAVs because there is such a heavy research and development emphasis on the vehicles, the sensors, the systems, the artificial intelligence that, that may go into these. Again, autonomous and trusted systems, those are two separate concepts, autonomy and trust, but they, 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 they merge in the concepts of the UAVs. And then education. I mean, clearly, uh, clearly our universities and our career tech centers are, are well positioned, uh, leading the nation in, in a lot of these uh, elements. Um, it's important to the governor, uh, clearly, because Ohio, the Ohio Department of Transportation has developed, runs the Ohio uh, Fly Drive, Ohio, and the Ohio UAS Center. Uh, and they are working incredibly closely with both the Air Force Research Lab as well as NASA Glenn on key issues involved in drone development, the integration of drones, and the use and uh, of those to, uh, to support uh, the state of Ohio, whether it's in ODOT work in terms of uh, um, inspecting bridges um, for uh, you know, roads, those kind of things. Very, very, uh, very important. Even to the point that Ohio has co-invested with uh, with the Air Force Research Lab to build what's called Sky Vision. It's and we can talk more about that later. But it's a, effectively a beyond line of sight enabling technology that allows uh, research and development of drone technology uh, beyond line of sight operating out of uh, out of Springfield. So heavily integrated permeates all pieces of where I work with the, uh, with the governor. And, and, and so it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, Built on a lot of experiences, both law and my time in the Air Force uh, in flight tests. So, so it, it's fascinating to see uh, the developments and the pace of developments in, uh, in drones. Well, Joe, thank you for that. And I should have mentioned uh, to our audience a little bit about your background. As I said, you're a retired Air Force Colonel uh, graduate of the Air Force Academy. You mentioned one master's degree. I understand you actually have a second one, uh, one in aeronautical engineering and the other in national resource strategy. Uh, your last duty position was uh, commanding the 46th test wing at the Eglin Air Force Base. And, uh, you know, not to be outdone, uh, you then went to law school um, and uh, been an attorney with uh, Sebeli, Shalito, and Dyer in Dayton since 2016. So I'm not sure when you sleep, but we appreciate your service to our country um, and your service to our profession. Uh, let me turn to Robert Tanner, um, who uh, in his past life was a general counsel of a small little company down in Columbus, something called NetJets, I think has a little bit something to do uh, with the aviation industry. Um, Bob, uh, what can you share with us in terms of your expertise and what you're working on as it touches on the issue of uh, unmanned aircraft and drones in Ohio? Thanks, Daryl. Um... Yes, I've, I've traded in my uh, business aviation card for uh, a drone card. Um, my wife's not too happy about that, but I, I, I tell her sooner or later, we're gonna be able to, with a personal air vehicle drone, we're gonna be able to go just about any place we want. So uh, anyway, it's um, great to be with you. I'm currently the executive director for the Ohio Federal Research Network. 
the OFRN, as we are recognized as, is the uh, creation of 2015 legislation that uh, the state of Ohio wanted to do all it could to promote research and development and to leverage the talent and capabilities of our federal labs. As, as Joe mentioned, the Air Force Research Lab, NASA Glenn, um, NASIC, uh, NAMRU-D, the, the, these federal installations that, that work in Ohio employ a lot of people and really position Ohio as, as a leader in uh, defense and aviation related uh, capabilities. We wanted those capabilities, technologies to be combined with the research that's being done in our, re our Ohio uh, research universities. Um, Ohio is recognized for some incredible aviation uh, universities, certainly Kent State among the top. Uh, but we then couple that with the industries that Ohio has, uh, the aviation industry. Um, I, I came from that industry, so uh, very familiar with all the supply chain capabilities that Ohio has uh, for Boeing, for Airbus. But when you take those three sectors, government, academia, and industry, and you start to form strategic alliances and partnerships, the outgrowth is uh, accelerated innovation, uh, commercialization of that technology, uh, spin out companies form, jobs are created, uh, you, you start to become uh, an attraction for additional federal funding. So the OFRN to date has uh, been responsible for some 900 plus new jobs. Uh, I think we've got um, some eight to 10 spin out companies, uh, which attracts uh, federal and private investment in the millions of dollars. So the OFRN really is, is the entity that pulls these organizations together, leverages their, their respective capabilities and builds new teams and new companies uh, based on those, those partnerships. Um, one of the ways we do that is through some competitive solicitations. We've actually got one on the street right now. It's our round five project that is intended to um, build, build those teams focused around EV tall technologies, uh, UAS technologies, and uh, the requirements require that you, you align your technology with a federal installation or a federal lab. You have two university partners and an industry, an Ohio company industry partner. So you build your team and you compete for uh, technology awards. Uh, last round, they were roughly in the million to million five range per project. I think we awarded six projects the last round. So, um, you know, a, a fairly attractive program, again, intended to spur technology and create jobs, uh, leveraging the, uh, the capabilities of the universities and our federal labs. So that's an exciting area. Um, I, I've enjoyed building partnerships for, for many, many years. I, I started doing that back uh, when I was with the Air, Airport Authority. We, we built a lot of uh, capability with um, actually with the railroad at the time, we've, we've built that with uh, industry. And these partnerships, these public-private partnerships are really what uh, can create jobs and advance technology, you know, in a, in a most rapid fashion. So OFRN's uh, doing that, we're, we're immersed in the UAS industry. Uh, our technologies and research, researchers in Ohio are doing some extraordinary things. We just tested some of those capabilities recently, and um, they're, they're, they're really industry leading. I mean, there's just too many of them to, to, to go through them today. You can certainly check our website, but uh, you know, what, one of the capabilities that we tested recently, uh, somebody, a question came up about um, you know, hackers. Well, we, we've got a small company that has developed a, a, a detect and avoid uh, capability and and they take a, a sensor fusion, a camera and radar, fuse those technologies on board and because they've got a, um, a, a, a unique patent on some uh, some of the technology, these these capabilities, these uh, detect and avoid and detect and mitigate technologies that we're working with are actually, uh, not able to be hacked. They are they are stealth in nature, and and they are uh, resistant to uh, to the current hacking uh, that, that goes on. So, Ohio is unique in that in that regard. 
Uh, the technology is certainly there. It's a matter of just deploying the technology, testing it, and then sharing that with the industry. We're, you know, we work hard to share all these capabilities with the FAA. Um, they're looking to ensure the safety uh, and the safe integration of UAS. And the way they do that is through these, uh, these technology developments, these use cases that we're doing here in Ohio. So there's a, there's a quick and dirty uh, overview of, uh, of what I've been doing. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Bob. Uh, before we uh, go to the questions, uh, Jason, I know we've got quite a number of Kent State students who may already know the answer to this, but for the rest of our audience, can you tell us a little bit about what you and the rest of the Kent State faculty are working on with respect to unmanned aircraft technology? Sure, so the big thing that's happening is, uh, the big thing that's unique about our college, the College of Aeronautics and Engineering, is the fact that we have a synergy both with the aeronautics and the engineering facets, which are I always find fascinating. I know that Dr. Stringer um, is on here, our, our graduate coordinator, and we have several um, several projects that we're working on with the OFRN. We're partnering on three OFRN projects. Uh, we're receiving um, DOD funding for eVTOL research. I know Charlie, you asked about eVTOL. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we're putting teams together for uh, OFR and round five. I'm actually involved in one of the projects. Um, part of my um, part of my uh, role in that project is trying to figure out how um, how practically we're going to be testing uh, drones and, and the vehicles in the pattern at Kent State Airport. And the project is is really uh, unique. It's you know called 3D printed antennas, which again it's going to be. Um, not only for a supply chain, but how does this work? How do we come up with this um, with this end product, which I, I find absolutely fascinating because most of the time my stuff is always on the legal uh, and policy side. A couple of the things that we're working on is, uh, as I serve as coordinator of the aeronautics program, um, we have a UAS minor available to students. And we also have the first year is our UAS major or concentration in uh, operations and policy. So we're gonna train the students to become UAS pilots. Um, they'll be able to, at the end of the four years, not only you know, have their part 107, but they'll be able to fly fixed wing aircraft and also understand the law uh, behind that as it's developing. And that's really where my area comes in in terms of what I've been doing research wise and going back to the Cosby case um, in a nutshell, looking at um, especially the FAA Appropriations Act that comes out each year, but especially a 2018. Um, long and short of it, going back to case law, privacy, I don't think uh, once we get to that point of our pizza being delivered by Uber Eats via drone, um, it's not going to be flying over your house. It's going to be following the roadways. So those of us who are old enough to remember the Jetsons, it's probably going to look a lot like the Jetsons, uh, probably from 150 to, to 400 feet uh, above our heads on following public roadways. Um, and, and I've come to that conclusion by researching um, uh, case law. Uh, there's a wonderful book of Who Owns the Sky that was uh, published back in 2010 before the explosion uh, of drones and UAVs. And also too, looking at uh, uniform tort law, um, the National Conference of Commissioners, it's funny that they keep waffling on this. And I think a lot of it is because of the history of aerial trespass. So lawyers, right? What's our, what's our three elements of trespass, right? Entry into the property of another, right? There's that whole intent um, the problem with aerial trespass, it ends the fourth L or ad, ends up adding the fourth element that there has to be substantial damage to a person's property. Now, taking and studying that case law since the beginning of the jet age, going back to Cosby, even pre Cosby, going to our own airport here, Cuyahoga County, I think you can shape probably pretty much 80% of uh, aviation and property law around that airport, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Uh, going back to the uh, Curtis Wright days, but nevertheless, going back to all of those, um, all of that, um, where does it lead us to today? Um, again, I, I see the, the airways following uh, the public roadways, public utility ways, 
unless of course there's an emergency. Um, it's kind of interesting on the uniform tort law relating the, the 2018 proposal really flanked what I'm saying. 2019, they kind of followed the uh, added element that there has to be substantial damage to a property. I don't know, looking at the Appropriations Act of, of 2018 and looking at what FAA is proposing, there has to be a certain distance, um, a vertical distance and a horizontal distance from buildings. Uh, but again, if you kind of do the math on that, it comes back to following roadways, following public utilities and, and easements and, 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 and such. So that's what I've been kind of working on at uh, Kent as well as what the future of certification is going to look like. Again, looking, uh, go back to the 2018 uh, Appropriations Act because there's so much in that particular piece of legislation. Um, one of the things uh, from a certification standpoint, I've been telling the engineers uh, at, at, um, at Kent is to look towards manufacturers determining uh, what these standards are gonna be, not only determining the, um, how some sort of industry standard is going to be, um, but the FAA is kind of, and I think that's the reaction that law is precedential, that takes so long. Those of us who work with the government, right? We can't get a decision like you can in private business. Private business, you can probably get a decision pretty quickly, but government, it takes several months or weeks up to several months before you can act on something. I think really the FAA is um, kind of um, looking towards that, looking towards manufacturers to, um, to develop these, these standards of what the, what the drones are actually uh, going to be not only looking like, but in, in terms of the safety. The other thing in terms of, of airman certification, I think will be flanking uh, a lot along what we do a type certification left up again to the manufacturer. So that just gives you an overview of the, the things that we're, we're working on that I'm working on at Kent. So thank you, Daryl. Thanks, Jason. Let me ask a, a question uh, to each of the panelists. Uh, Professor Ravitch talked about it a, a little bit, but uh, this concern about um, imported drones from other countries uh, sharing data, whether it's you know individual level data or metadata, and how that coincides with the, the pandemic. It, it, is, it, is it really a, a legitimate concern that somehow China or some other country source, you know, country of origin where these products um, are silently harvesting data and can somehow exploit that for some purpose. Um, any, anyone care to comment on that? So uh, I'll just start off. I mean, you know, clearly you got to be, be cautious in terms of the uh, hardware. Um, certainly the Department of Defense, uh, DHS is, uh, uh, you know, has noted that in terms of uh, what uh, what uh, UAV systems can be uh, can be used, can be acquired. Uh, so, so it's a concern uh, clearly, and uh, is it is it one that uh, you know suggests hey, you know, a domestic um, uh, UAS drone industry? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of advantages certainly certainly to that, but uh, th those kind of technology uh, pieces, and I think where, where you're really getting at, Daryl, is the uh, is what goes in the data stream and how can that data stream be used and where, where does it end up? And, and I tend to put it into two categories that, that, are, that really are um, with due caution. Um, the, the first of those is, is, as you've described, the data, the data that's coming down that, that, that's being used for whatever the purpose of the, uh, of the drone or of the UAS system is, right? And so how that data is used and where that data goes either directly or incidentally is important to know, right? I mean, that, that should be, we should have some, some degree of control over the data that we're, uh, that we're acquiring and using, uh, especially as it may bear on uh, on any issues of, uh, of privacy, clearly. The second, the second piece, we touched on this as well, and Tim talked about this as well. The second electronic uh, stream that is critical to understand and control is clearly the control system, right? So in other words, um, can it be, as, uh, as we've talked about earlier, can it be um, 
uh, can the control of the drone be interfered with? Can it be taken? Can can the system be actually uh, you know taken down by interference with uh, with the control stream? So those those are the two areas of electronic security that I think we need to be conscious of, understanding where those uh, where those data streams go, uh, and uh, how those data streams are secured and maintained for the purposes of the operation of the system. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, uh, Tim or Bob or Jason, anything to add on that subject? No, there's one story that uh, always caught my attention. Um, I've been watching this for a few years now. The uh, United States Department of Homeland Security Immigration Customs Enforcement, uh, in my law practice to deal with them pretty regularly enforcing the laws on the interior of immigration. Uh, but uh, one of their operatives, one of their officers did find a leak. Uh, they were using D, uh, DJI products and they found a leak of information going back to China. And that's really what the pro began, I believe the prohibition against law enforcement in the United States using uh, those platforms in law enforcement. That's one of the things I you know, keep looking for um, seeing in the communiques that I get, um, seeing where that, that data mining happens, um, and just to be careful of that and be aware of that. Thanks, Jason. Tim? I was just going to, my only two cents is that um, I think it's going to be imperative for uh, manufacturers and operators to be uh, uh, to sort of go to the center of the room on this and to show how their uh, materials aren't, um, they're, they're going to need to gain social acceptance. And I think the burden's on them. I mean, whether it's a, a Trump administration going to a Biden administration, I, I think there's a bipartisan concern uh, about uh, many types of things from pharmaceuticals to drones not being, uh, being produced outside of our country. And, and drones certainly are, are kind of a poster child for that. So I think we're going to have, uh, companies are going to have to be very careful if they want to uh, reap the benefits uh, of, of the uh, emerging space. Uh, Bob, we've got a specific question about the uh, OFRN. Um, has OFRN's focus in terms of drone development, new programs, uh, or navigating around personal privacy shifted with the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and have companies allied with OFRN seen a major increase, decrease, or you know, really any kind of change um, in employment during the pandemic? Yeah, great question. And we are indeed focused on COVID-related activities. Um, we, we're working on a project actually to do a, de a, a demonstration to take um, COVID swabs and move them on, on a campus from a um, athletic facility over to a lab. Um, they were testing some 500, uh, doing 500 samples per hour, and it wasn't feasible to have uh, a vehicle actually transport those and go through all the traffic that's on, on, on a campus. Um, these sorts of opportunities and, and use cases, I, I think everybody recognizes the technology is certainly there. You know, we could do this tomorrow, but uh, in this case, uh, those swabs are considered biohazardous uh, from the FAA, and those are, are going to take a whole lot more regulation. You know, it, it's not just a uh, an easy 107 waiver uh, when you're doing biohazard uh, transport, but but that's just one example of uh, you know a, a use case that we were working on. Um, lots of lots of technologies are are going to be um, accelerated for use in, in the COVID um, campaign and the COVID uh, battle. So it, it's I think as Tim said, um, you know, um, this has actually created an opportunity for these technologies and and for UAVs to be relevant. And we're doing everything we can to to test those technologies, demonstrate those, and um, and get FAA support and concurrence for for continued use. You know, everybody knows it's it's you, you can do some 107 stuff, but but uh, really, if you can get to a BV loss state, 
that is that is really, uh, as was mentioned, the holy grail for the industry. So, so we're working hard to uh, to do that to demonstrate that we can we can do that uh, sort of test. We we've, we've got a a test that the FAA has sanctioned. Uh, it's it's in our what's called our 33 corridor, and uh, it's over a 20 mile stretch where we would be operating uh, BV loss, but. Um, yeah, the COVID uh, circumstances, uh, unfortunate as they are, they have presented opportunities for us to really leverage and highlight these these technologies and, and the drone use. So stay tuned for that uh, to continue. Well, and speaking of opportunities, in addition to just the pandemic, uh, to what extent have any of you seen uh, drones deployed uh, in connection with other types of uh, natural disasters to address community needs? So, oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, Bob. Hey, go, go right ahead. Well, we, we're we're actually working with a um, a local uh, police department and fire department uh, to demonstrate uh, again some some low altitude operations in a BV loss scenario. We've got technology that we think can do this. It's uh, you know, again, a combination of, of uh, sensors, cameras, and radars uh, that are operated at low altitude. And, um, you know, the, the application for public safety and for health and safety and, uh, you know, in, in uh, circumstances where you've got a, a you know, either a, a, a weather storm or you've got, uh, frankly, um, social uh, disruption. I mean, there's just so many applications for these technologies, and we 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 know that, and we're working as fast as we can to demonstrate those technologies um, and get FAA approval so that we can begin to commercialize them and and push them out. But but uh, the FAA, to their credit, has given uh, those types of technologies, particularly relating to, to public safety and public health. A little more leeway when it comes to getting, um, you know, 107 uh, waivers. So um, things move a little quicker when you're when you're going to take up a case that's got that sort of uh, implication, which is a good thing. And Joe, I think you were looking to weigh in on this issue as well. Yeah, I mean, the the so Daryl, uh, the the usage of of uh, of drones of unmanned uh, aerial systems. I mean, it, it truly, it's, uh, it's limited only by your imagination. Uh, I, you, you ask, what have I observed? So in, in, a, in my personal uh, experience, um, I've observed some, some very, very fascinating usage. I mean, from the traditional public service. So my dad was a firefighter, right? And the, the traditional view of a fire truck approaching a fire is everybody's, they're, they're leaning out the windows, looking how to set up, how, where to, uh, where to attack the uh, where to attack the fire? Imagine, if you will, the idea of as the as the truck approaches the um, uh, approaches the fire, that a drone launches, goes overhead and looks down, and now you can properly position people with minimum risk and maximum efficiency. And and it's it's absolutely fascinating. There was a um, an incident in uh, fire incident in Dayton. A uh, uh, there was a drone uh, that was uh, that was used. This was about ten years ago. Uh, stimulated some other questions, but in terms of, of this topic, um, and went overhead. The the fire chief looked at the video and goes, "This is fantastic. It is so much safer to use this than putting one of my people on top of a hundred foot aerial ladder to look down and get a, get an idea of the uh, of the threat of the uh, uh, of the issue." So, I mean, incredible to relieve. Um, uh, risk and to uh, improve uh, effectiveness. And you see that in, uh, in parcel copters in drone delivery by mail. I think DHL has done that in Europe um, uh, from, uh, from Jutland to the outlying islands in many ways safer than a helicopter, right? Because it doesn't care, it does, but it doesn't necessarily care to the same degree with all due respect to an instrument rated helicopter pilot about weather over there in the North Sea, right? I mean, just boom, out, at, you know, push the button at 11 o'clock, it takes off, flies to the island, lands, um, and the, the mail is unloaded, and at 12 o'clock, push the button and it comes back. Uh, incredibly effective, uh, in, in many ways, arguably a lot safer. 
there, there's some other fascinating, uh, fascinating usage line, uh, utility inspection, pipeline inspection, where you can truly do inspections in a much more efficient manner, much closer and in a safer manner than you can with, uh, with piloted uh, helicopters. Uh, I think the helicopter community would probably tell you one of the more dangerous operations, not the most, but one of the more dangerous operations is actually utility and pipeline survey. So the ability to do this again in an efficient, safe manner, incredibly, incredibly effective. Um, think about News Chopper, you know, pick your channel, News Chopper X, right? No longer a Bell Jet Ranger, right? It's about this big now. It doesn't have the maintenance, the, the uh, acquisition costs, the pilot costs, and those kind of things. And you can probably get really good video from a little camera like that. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible how that can be transformed to, uh, to news properly, uh, again, properly and safely implemented. There's another usage that was, uh, that was dramatic that I saw uh, certainly um, my time down in Florida, we were crisscrossed by, uh, by six hurricanes when I was uh, stationed at Eglin Air Force Base over the time. Um, and insurance was having a hard time getting around to get folks adjusted, right? And to get, get, the, uh, get the right insurance onto the right folks who needed it the, uh, needed the most. I've seen usage, as a matter of fact, some, some very, very interesting articles in Unmanned Systems uh, related to the use of UAVs in the, in, the, uh, in the insurance adjustment world where a natural disasters occurred and you can take a look and scan before and after and get a great idea of, uh, of damage from, you know, from an aerial vantage point, incredibly effective. And I think that's been, uh, at least from, from, my, uh, from my readings, that's been, uh, been pretty, uh, pretty successful. So, so the limitations in terms of how you can apply this technology, again, they're, they're boundless. And, and I separate, separate the, uh, uh, the piece parts of the technology. One is the vehicle, right? Whether it's piloted or unpiloted, the other is the sensor, right? And and so when you when you marry those two, then you you have opportunity space. But I think you need to take into account one vice the other, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know in terms of those kind of developments. So incredible opportunities. Well, thank you. Um... <clears throat> Uh, the one, the one picture that I've used in some, not to answer my own question, but I will. Uh, the one picture that I like have liked to use in presentations is um, uh, down in, I think it was in Puerto Rico in the aftermath of uh, one of the hurricanes. They were uh, trying to restring power lines through a valley, and it was a lot easier to send, a, you know, a little bit larger drone, not your off-the-shelf DJI, uh, but they send the drone over um, with the rope uh, to kind of pre-string it, and then they can pull the power line. Uh, and again, you know, the operational costs of that are a fraction of what they would be if you had to fly in a turbine helicopter, you know, for, for one line pull. Um, so again, to Joe's point, you know, there's just a, you, you, you dream it up, somebody's going to think it up and, and deploy it. Well, and you make a really, really good point, uh, Daryl. I'll take that one step further. For example, uh, the 910th airlift wing out of uh, Youngstown. They fly uh, aerial spray missions with their C-130 uh, H-2s, right? And in, before they do that, because they have to fly at such a low altitude, they have to take, a, uh, take an aircraft, do a survey of the route to ensure that they are clear of, of very low altitude obstructions, which may include, in my flying days, we would find in some places, uh, not in the U.S., but, but uh, other countries, you would find power lines strung between two mountain peaks or something like that. So, so the idea that I have to take, uh, take a manned aircraft, go and fly this and do a, uh, do a survey can be replaced by literally a drone uh, effectively leading the, uh, leading the C-130 and doing its own low altitude survey, much less risk to, a, uh, to an air crew before, uh, before they go out and actually perform the mission. So again, it's only limited by, uh, by imagination and, and how you can do this to reduce risk and increase efficiencies. So, so let me ask you this, if, if each of you had a, a magic wand and could call upon uh, your favorite uh, congressman, uh, uh, federal or state, uh, to pass a law that could do just one thing 
uh, to either solve a regulatory a problem or promote this industry? Um, what, what would you ask for? And, and Jason, I'll start with you. That's a really good question, Daryl. And, and I really don't know because there's so much that's developing in this area and it's developing quickly. I think the, uh, since I've been talking about this the last four or five years, um, you know, the FAA is, you know, if you read through those Appropriations Act, it is making it easier for the manufacturers to come in and to develop this technology. One of the things I'm hoping is that, you know, you have, uh, when we first started this, we're going to conferences back in 2015, 2016, 2017, you have your group of agronomists over in the corner talking about what their applications are. You've got your construction applications and those folks in one corner of the room. You have your engineers, your civil engineers, your um, military applications. And one of the things that was missing was connecting all of these. And I think we're getting a lot better in terms of collaborating and getting everybody to work together, especially as the industry develops, as things pan out. Okay, I mean, again, this is a very nascent industry, as we all know, there's going to be several, many different manufacturers that won't stand the test of time just because of lack of capitalization, lack of imagination, maybe they think it's the new gold rush. And I think legislation to, to reflect that and make it easier for that collab, uh, collaboration, and maybe that's just the way it's going to be as technology develops. I mean, it's going to be a totally different time. Uh, a year from now, as it's going to be five years from now, and as it was even 10 years ago. I know there's a couple of questions about, you know, 10 years ago, this was a very big hobbyist uh, industry. Um, it wasn't until the military technology went over to what I call the consumer when it made that jump to consumerism. So it, it's going to be uh, potentially multifaceted. But again, thinking of making it easier to connect all the dots so that we're working together as one big team to try and make this easier. Uh, and it may just be the development that we need the engineers to develop the technology. Um, and I always uh, enjoy teaching at Kent, especially, um, you know, you have your pilot students who come in, what do they want to do? They want to fly it. They don't care what the engineer is doing. All they want to do is give me the controls. I want to fly it. And the engineer, I just remember the first time I taught this uh, applied course, a few years ago, we we're actually building drones. It's one of the, the senior level courses. And one of the engineers had everything all set up. And one of the pilots came in, took the controls, gave it full power, and the thing flipped and broke and they had to redesign it. And you know, the engineers were really upset with the pilots. And I thought, okay, guys, you gotta work as a team. So I guess I'm looking for legislation like that. I just don't know if it's possible, but just to help connect the dots, give us that collaboration that we need. But it just may be part of how things develop. Thanks, Jason. Bob, what's on your wish list? You know, um, I, I'd probably start with setting up some safety standards. I think that is really what is holding the entire industry back. The FAA obviously wants to make sure that, that you know, there is the safe integration of UAS into the national airspace system. And Frankly, they're going through this process of watching the technology evolve, watching the use cases, and you know it, it's sort of um, you know they'll they'll know it when they see it, uh, sort of a litmus test as to when is it safe. Well, if we had some standards uh, to begin to create the framework so that we could begin to fly, I mean the technology is there. We, we know we can conduct safe flights, um, but the regulations um, are, are, are lagging and, and that's the impediment right now. We cannot do enough uh, data gathering because we can't do enough tests because the concern is that there isn't safety there. So the FAA is gonna you know, go through you know, a, a, a very rigorous process to ensure that those flights are safe. And that's good. Um, but at some point, we're, we're going to have to flip the switch and say we, we have a safe environment and, and developing the standards uh, based on data, I think, um, would, would be a, a step in the right direction. So I, it's a tough question. There's a lot of pieces to the, to the puzzle, but I think safety is a, is a primary one. Tim or Joe, what's on your wish list? Um, so, Daryl, uh, let me put it in this context, if you will. 
um, what are the what, what's holding the uh, the industry? What are what are the keys to moving the industry forward? And I think there are two. One is personal, and one is technical. Um, let's start with the technical. Um, sense and avoid understanding sense and avoid beyond line of sight uh, requirements and integration. And if one can do that, one can achieve those uh, those uh, technical and regulatory uh, steps. Then, then one goes a long way to the integration of these systems into the national airspace. I, when I was um, uh, at uh, Holloman Air Force Base back in 2002, we did some of the first sense and avoid uh, work on uh, unmanned systems uh, over White Sands Missile Range. Fascinating stuff, incredibly capable. Um, and so the question is, over that intervening time, and it's been it's been uh, uh, almost uh, almost 20 years since uh, since that time when we started working those issues. Um, the technology is there, but to what standard, right? To what degree of nines are we really looking for in terms of surety of the uh, of the system? And um, and so no impact has been is not necessarily uh, the answer. And what is that answer? Where is that? That those are key questions, and that's why I say the technical sense and avoid capabilities that successfully integrate into the national airspace are, are, are one of the key piece parts that can allow this industry to move uh, forward. The second I mentioned was personal, and that's really due regard to privacy. It's it's ensuring, and, and you heard we heard a lot about that today from Tim and from um, a lot of our discussion has been focused on privacy. Due regard towards privacy then allows acceptance of the technology into the commercial space, into the public space uh, more, more fully. And, and that's, that's absolutely critical. And it's, and it's important both in terms of privacy of the acquisition of the data, re retention of the data, the, the data stream, the storage and where it goes. We've touched on each one of those subjects. But they all fit under it, at least in, in my mind, just a general umbrella of privacy. When, when I go and, and when I've talked about um, uh, drones or UAVs, I'll, I'll have a little, small little one. And, and it's, it's incredible I, um, that I'll, I'll show folks, and you, go, I got, you got this for 40 bucks. I get this for 40 bucks from a store. And you can fly it right out of the box, right? You can fly it right out of the box and not, you know, and, and do pretty darn well with it, right? And then, and everybody's, wow, that's, that's so nice. Then you flip it over, look what else you get for 40 bucks. You get the camera in the belly. And everybody goes, ooh, there's a visceral reaction. It's like, that's really neat, ooh. And that's what you have to work towards is the, um, I, I think is the, is the acceptance of and a due regard towards the proper use of the technology and under that umbrella of privacy. If we can do that and, um, and in, in a very credible manner, then, then I think those are the two things that allows the industry to move, uh, to move forward. I will say um, this, that in terms of um, new technology, Agility Prime, for example, that's the urban air mobility for military applications, like I was mentioning. Um, the ability to work those regulatory, those airworthiness issues coincident with the development of the technology, and in this case, highly automated, you know, uh, technology, a lot of uh, autonomy and trusted systems that's going into at least the uh, agility prime variants of the uh, urban air mobility concepts. Um, the ability to work those into airworthiness, into regulatory, and even as, you know, Jason would go into pilot certification are probably are, are key so you don't suffer the delays we've just kind of talked about in terms of opening up the um, opening up the the industry I think that that's important if you can break that that roadblock then you can allow integration into uh, into the commercial space into the use of space you know a lot a lot quicker so uh, those those kind of things and I think that's what's important about developing the technology developing the uh, the uh, the operational concepts uh, in proximity to the folks who do the research and also the folks who do the airworthiness. So I, I think that presents tremendous, tremendous opportunities for accelerating at least this new part, the uh, 
you know, the electrified, uh, you know, urban air mobility aircraft. And what is it? What's the pilot? What is a pilot on an urban air mobility aircraft? You know, is it a helicopter pilot? It's not, you don't necessarily need to know how to auto rotate to fly that. It's, it's maybe a rotorcraft, but it's a different kind of thing. I can fly the control system. Heck, my, my master's degree was in, you know, automated flight controls, right? Would it would have cost millions of dollars 25 years ago to get the flight control system in this little $40 piece. But that's replicated at a much greater level in these kind of electrified, uh, uh, you know, urban air mobility aircraft. So what do you need and what kind of certifications do you need to fly that? Those are key questions, as I'm sure, you know, Jason's addressing in a lot of his research you know, what do we need in the future in terms of a pilot certification that addresses the new technologies that are, that are emerging? Fascinating, but I think they're moving forward and learning the lessons from the UAV uh, experience of integration now in the, uh, into the urban air mobility integration. Yeah. Well, thanks, Joe. I think that leaves, uh, Tim, you're batting cleanup. So uh, in the couple of minutes we have left, what do you think our legislators need to be focusing on to promote this industry? Yeah, you know, I love the question. It's actually stuff I've uh, focused quite a lot on. I wrote an article uh, two years ago, I think, in the Columbia Business Law Review about and asserted the argument that drones and some of these other uh, emerging aviation technologies might be what we call a permissionless technology. In other words, why do we need to go to the regulators uh, so much, especially where many of these regulators, or excuse me, many of the companies are self-regulated to do the right thing? Uh, it, you know, you need to regulate pilots, of course, but pilots also don't want to crash the plane. You know, air, these manufacturers want uh, good public relations. They want uh, things to improve. Now, the Boeing 737 MAX complicates things uh, because it shows that there is a need for regulators and that if you sometimes leave the Fox to watch the handhelds, there, there are problems. So we have to strike a balance. But to answer your question, I think crisply, what would I tell a, a regulator or a lawmaker? I would say, get out of the way on the things that you can get out of the way on and get more involved, please. What other industry wants regulations other than drones? Like we, there's actually like an appetite for guidance in so many ways. And the model, just to conclude, I think the model I would look to is what's going on in part uh, 23, uh, where general aviation is a renaissance in general aviation because what, what's happened in part 23 is a good you know, private public partnership with the FAA and manufacturers to say, look, uh, you know, trust but verify. Uh, we're going to build a good um, machine. We're going to test it. We're going to have, uh, you know, standard operating uh, procedures or consensus standards that will apply. And if we can meet those, everyone's really going to be uh, satisfied uh, by that. And I think that's a, part 23 for me is a very, very uh, good model that probably came at the expense of uh, the tortured process by which drone regulations in Part 107 occurred, right? There was delay. There was unfair, I thought, criticism of the FAA. Um, you know, they were afraid the sky was going to go, you know, black with these 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 sorts of airplanes. Um, and the FAA is in a tough position. There are unscrupulous people out there. There are people who are going to, you know, cause that accident. Um, but anyway, I thought the regulators were too concerned about the unscrupulous regulator at the expense of the scrupulous. And maybe we're finally getting to a point now where, uh, especially in eVTOL and urban air mobility, mobility uh, drone companies can follow that lead and say, here's how it works, here's the standard, it's safe. L let us please operate in the marketplace now. Well, I wanna thank uh, Joe and uh, Bob and uh, Jason for, and of course, Professor Ravitch for participating in the panel discussion. And uh, Jason, according to the agenda that was sent to me, uh, I'm supposed to kick it back to you for uh, uh, two minutes of uh, concluding remarks. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Daryl. Again, um, thank you to all of you. Thank you, Daryl, for moderating. Uh, thank you, Joe, uh, for being here. Bob, for being here. Uh, really appreciate the discussion, hopefully giving uh, the participants some things to think about uh, in this ever-changing area. Um, it was wonderful being on a panel of all of you, but of course, a special thanks to Tim um, for coming on and, and doing this and putting this together for us. And again, thank you to all of you. I'm certainly probably won't be able to sleep tonight. I'm so excited about this and dreaming now about drones all night. 
And thank you again to all of you. Uh, just one mention, I know Dr. Joyce Harrison is with us. She's our Associate Dean for uh, Faculty Affairs. So I wanna just uh, make everybody aware that she's with us tonight and thank you for, for being here and thank you to, to the Dean for allowing us to do this. And thank you to all of you, the participants for being here, to my students. And again, um, we will, um, uh, we will keep you posted because this is certainly won't be the last uh, of these events that we're uh, going to be hosting. Again, thank you to all of you and have a good night. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, folks. Good evening. All right. Thank you.